Welcome to the SDG Media Zone. I'm Paulina Greer. With me today is Inger Anderson. She is the Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. Welcome, Inger. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're joined by Elizabeth Marema, Executive Secretary of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Now we're meeting on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly ahead of a major biodiversity summit. And we're meeting obviously on Zoom because of COVID. Um, let me ask you first, Inger, with everything that's happening in the world, why are we talking about biodiversity now? Well, I'm sure that Elizabeth will go into this in much greater detail, but here we are, right? We have unsustainably produced and consumed our way into three planetary crises. The crisis of nature, we're losing species at a speed we've never seen before. Ipes last year said that we were about to lose a million species if we don't take action. The crisis of climate, need I say more, the Secretary General Summit last year called for action on climate and the crisis of pollution and waste. That crisis may be not as visible to, to those that have good uh, systems for collection, et cetera, but very real and may be seen most uh, to most uh, in the public domain in the context of the plastic crisis, but there's much more than plastic. So these three crises, it's us causing it, not the other, it's us. It's the way we produce, the way we consume. So we need to have a, a, a hard look at that and one of the things we need to look at is obviously biodiversity, that nature, the nature that sustains us and gives us everything that we need from the clothes we wear to the water we drink to the food we eat and, and, and so on and so forth. So, and this is happening in the middle of a pandemic, a pandemic that is in part caused by our fragmentation of nature, our illegal trade of species, our mixing species that have no business being together. It's a zoonosis from the zoological world. And so, yes, we need to have a conversation about nature, which is why I'm so grateful to Elizabeth for her leadership of the biological, uh, of the biodiversity convention, because that's where we need to strike some big agreements. And you had just mentioned it, Inger. Uh, Elizabeth, let me let me bring you in because, as Inger had mentioned, you are with the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, and one of your jobs is to measure the variety of life in the world. So, how are we doing? Unfortunately, we are not doing well. Uh, but of course, we need to acknowledge that some progress, uh, particularly based on actions taken by many governments, many stakeholders, there is some progress. But by and large, not doing good at all. The COVID situation, just as Inga said, unfortunately has brought everything at four, particularly highlighting the importance of uh, our relationship between us people and nature, and reminded us of the profound consequences of our well-being, our own survival, and our continued results of the loss of biodiversity and degradation of the ecosystem. The recent reports, if we look particularly at the Global Biodiversity Outlook uh, recent one, we are coming to the end of a decade of IH biodiversity target. Not one uh, IH target will be fully met. So that by itself, of the 20 targets, 10 years, we have failed. Yes, we've made progress in about six or so about them, but even the progress, if you look at the scorecard like a, a school report, the highest is below 30% of the progress. So measuring even at that, yes, some progress, but not at the magnitude that we should be delighted. Hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, by the end of the year, we may uh, succeed to reach probably IH biodiversity target 11, together with the SDG target 14.5, uh, both uh, calling on 17%, 10% respectively of terrestrial and marine areas, because now the percentage remaining is very small, and we know many 
uh, governments are really trying to get their data uh, recorded the uh, uh, the global database. So probably we might have good successes there, but by and large, we are not doing well. And clearly, as Inga had said, the bottom line, the dangerous global species today is us, human beings. So we are talking of many species, but the single most dangerous one is, a, is us human beings. And human beings, with all the activities we do, whether it is food production, it is food systems, it's uh, our own human choices uh, in terms of consumption, uh, the choices in terms of polluting the air, polluting the environment with plastics. So everything, the dangerous, uh, the most uh, dangerous species in the global today, causing the unprecedented rate of biodiversity loss in the history of humankind, leading to further uh, degradation of the land, of biodiversity and climate crisis. Let's talk about the Biodiversity Summit. The theme this year is urgent action on biodiversity for sustainable development. So I'd like to hear from both of you. What type of action are you looking for at the summit? But for us in the uh, biodiversity commu uh, community, key number one, uh, the fact that it is the summit at heads of state, head of government, it gives us and shows us that political will to take action. And this is what uh, we are seeing, uh, looking forward to the summit, looking at the number of uh, the heads of state and minister uh, and uh, governments ready to speak. And I'm sure they will speak not supporting nature loss, biodiversity loss, but underlining, reasserting their commitment to protecting and conserving biodiversity in supporting sustainable development, in particular, the sustainable development goals. Because 11 of the 17 SDGs actually have biodiversity nature component in them. So clearly, conserving and protecting biodiversity 100% contributes to reaching a number of targets of the sustainable development goals. So looking at those, underlying the importance of the agenda, underlining the importance of also integrated, holistic, multi-rhythm nature of looking at issues, not single issues, it's climate crisis, land degradation crisis, biodiversity crisis, pollution crisis, chemicals crisis. So all this in an integrated fashion. Uh, also looking at further uh, underlining the importance of mainstreaming uh, these environmental biodiversity issues across all sectors of the economy at national level. So again, whole of government, whole of society approach in looking uh, at these issues. We're also, also looking at uh, renewed uh, calls of support of an ambitious, transformative global biodiversity framework, which will take over from the uh, IH biodiversity target and building uh, upon learning lessons from that into really a transformative framework, uh, underlining particularly not just having a framework on paper, but later its implementation on the ground. And we hope then the summit will present that opportunity to member states to really lay out their support and explore these issues which will be negotiated. And more so really demonstrate that link between biodiversity nature issues, all environmental issues, all of which are also sustainable development goals issues. You cannot deal with any of the sustainable development issues, the 17, where you will say is not an important factor. Be it poverty elevation, be equity equality, be it education, consumption and production patterns, be it life on land, life on water, partnerships, just mention any. It has major component of environment on it. And we come back 
human beings and our actions will make a difference in future. And these are those commitments, political will at the highest level of government, hope we'll hear come 30th September. If the summit was happening in person, who would be the top person or entity on your list? Who is the first person or entity that you would want to speak to? <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. But being uh, a summit organized by the United Nations, of course, and being also part of the UN family, I'll be very interested to hear what our boss will say to the global community. That will be number one. And then after that, we'll be really interested to hear uh, statements from the current president of the Conference of the Party and the next president uh, of the Conference of the Party. So Egypt and the journey from Egypt to China, since China will take us forward. Then after that, of course, all governments regionally represented so that we get the views of all uh, different sectors of different, uh, uh, different governments because each country is different. The national circumstances are different. Priorities also may be different. Much we all agree biodiversity nature is important, but still all these need to be aligned with the national circumstances. So it's important to also hear all of them, to really get all the nuances, the potentials uh, moving forward. Maybe just to add, because I know Elizabeth has worked hard to ensure that that also happens, the voice of youth, youth. the next generation. She's actually secured a, a speaker, uh, so I know that. Uh, but that's really important. Just like in the climate movement and in the Climate Action Summit, we saw that the energy that the young people bring in, into the room, onto the street, over dinner tables, back at home, into the classroom, and eventually into the voting booth, that is an energy that we want to see also for nature and biodiversity. And then not to forget, um, the voice of indigenous people. Indigenous people are probably the best stewards of nature and that voice in the UN and beyond is irrepressible and critical. And so ensuring that uh, that voice is understood and, and heard and respected. Uh, indigenous people as environmental defenders, indigenous people as stewards of biodiversity and indigenous peoples of holders of knowledge um, that we can all learn from and study. And finally, we want to hear from private sector because we need to understand that much of the, not that I want to put blame, but I want to put responsibility on private sector. I said before, we all eat, so we all have to understand that uh, eating is important, but our agricultural practices need to change for the better. And so that means that big agriculture has a, has a to-do item on its list uh, in terms of how we do that. And policy makers have a to-do item in helping them shift. And today our, our, our incentives and our subsidies are not necessarily going in the direction that we would like to see agricultural subsidies go. So how do we subsidize nature positive agriculture? So these are the kind of voices that we hope will come up. But as Elizabeth said, the most important voice is strong commitments in the mouths of heads of state. Because as she's journeying to her COP, having the heads of state make strong pronouncements in front of the world, be it virtual or not, that's immaterial, really matters. Because as she said, they are not going to say we will continue a path of destruction. They are going to say we will get on a path of sustainable uh, sustainability. And that's what we look forward to hearing. You had both mentioned the COP and China. So next year in China, there will be a, a UN Biodiversity Conference. And at that point, countries are expected to adopt a new framework that will represent global commitments to put nature on a path to recovery. 
by 2030, I should add. Elizabeth, we've spoken about the summit that will happen here, but where are we with that framework that's coming out next year? Good question, where are we? Currently, the world is looking at an updated zero draft which is out there for public review. It is not yet negotiated. Uh, it has been negotiated only in one meeting. The next meeting will come next year. But uh, during this period is period of review, period of informal consultations, period of uh, raising awareness, and period of receiving as more and much input to it as uh, the reviewers, all stakeholders uh, can give, particularly to the co-chairs, so as to come up with uh, a proper 1.0 draft for the next formal negotiation meeting. However, when one looks at it, uh, yes, one, it is the goals are aligned to 2030 agenda, and we know 2030 agenda is also our 2030 SDGs, as I indicated earlier, biodiversity is a bigger component of the content of the SDGs as we have. So that alignment is very critical that uh, countries will see not an added action, but actually what they are doing, they are also contributing to implementation uh, of both, not just the framework when it is adopted, but also our commitments to the Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, the, the, the draft already provides the goals, uh, hopefully smart targets as expected, simple language, uh, clear, and more so it builds from the lessons learned from uh, the, I would say, quote unquote, failures of the Aichi targets. For instance, uh, the framework will have a strong monitoring uh, component uh, and review mechanism coming up with it to be able to take a, a global stock taking and enhance national review to really track progress uh, during implementation. And of course, uh, it includes already a set of uh, really using 2030 as milestone to enhance progress towards reaching our long-term uh, goal of living in harmony with nature. The framework, again, learning from the IT biodiversity target will be accompanied uh, by a resource mobilization, capacity building, science, technology transfer, knowledge management, communication strategy, all these which had not been considered uh, as important implementation tools uh, during the IT biodiversity target. And we hope also when it is adopted that there will be no time lag to begin implementation. During IH biodiversity target for many countries, it took few years before uh, actual implementation began because a number of countries began with putting in place the national strategies and action plans for implementation. Now that they're in place, we are not calling for reverting the will. So basically implementation should be able to begin immediately. And even if there are any other adjustments, those could be done in tandem as implementation uh, continues. So we hope these lessons uh, learned from the IT targets being built into this framework and underlining that the framework is not for governments alone. This was the assumption with the H biodiversity targets. But the framework will be for everybody, universally applicable. And that's why, again, it's important at national level that it, will be, it is mainstreamed into, again, the whole of society, whole of government approach in an integrated, holistic manner. So I'd just like to give you both an opportunity to have a final word. What is important is we will have the summit, a platform to underline the importance of biodiversity, a roadmap leading to COP15, COP15, which we hope will adopt the new post-20 uh, 
post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So what we'll be calling is really action, action now. We have no time to wait. Biodiversity loss, nature loss is at an unprecedented level in the history of mankind. We all know, as we've said, solutions are known. Many tools are there. The understanding and awareness now has grown than ever before that we even have all menace, all stakeholders talking about nature, talking about biodiversity, be it the banks, the finance, the business, private sector, indigenous people, local communities, the youth, individual, you and me. So really action should begin, we should continue and tangible, transformative, innovative actions without any further delay. No. Maybe what I would add here is no. um, it's probably time for reflection what it really is we're doing, right? What it is that we're doing to our planet. This is zoom out into the universe and look into that little blue speck, that little tiny blue speck that is our only home. And understand that, as Elizabeth has said, this one species is about to cause its fundamental shift. That power that we are holding as humanity, that power that we can actually change the very fundamentals of planet Earth, time immemorial in terms of evolution, the stability of our climate, the fact that we know this, science tells us this, pandemics is showing us this it's time for action and understanding therefore that the heads of state now what they will say will really matter because future generations will judge them were they going to be the leaders were we going to be the citizens were we going to be the leaders that stood and let species and nature disappear so that your grandchild or mine will not see that magnificent animal or that inc incredible flower or, or the very being of ecosystem that supports us. It's not small. It's very, very big because it is the future of food security, because it is the future of peace because it is the future of humanity as we understand it. So yes, we are living in a moment where from our pockets, from taxpayers' pockets, we are seeing and never before streams of funding going into the private sector to boost it. That's good because we want to save jobs. But we have an obligation to absolutely make sure that these funds do not go into persevering our destructive path. We have an obligation to ensure that these funds shift us onto sustainability. That's a conversation. And so I think uh, this is what we're trying to do and uh, each in our way. And we from UNEP and together with obviously the executive secretary from CBD, we're pushing as hard as we can to make us land where we need to for sustainability in the long run. Inger Anderson, Elizabeth Morena, thank you for speaking with me in the SDG Media Zone.